All right, I have a few announcements to make. Um, actually, just one announcement to make. Uh, and then I will give us some prayer requests for this evening. Um, so the announcement has something to do with the Christmas party. I was asked to explain how the gift exchange is going to work. Okay, so last year the men exchanged pocket knives. And this year the men are going to explain exchange a small hand tool. So it could be a knife, a chisel, a hammer, something like that. Okay, so small hand tools for the men. And then the women are going to exchange some kind of a cup. So mug, tumbler, water bottle, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's going to be the gift exchange. Again, that is Saturday the 2nd of December. What time is that? 6.30. Okay, so please, if you've signed up, there's a sign-up table in the back. Just remember what, those, uh, what the gift exchange is this year, and uh, hopefully we'll see you there for that. Okay, second thing. I was asked this morning, and honestly, I was offended by the question, but somebody said, are we going to have morning church on December 24th? What do you think the answer is? Yes, okay, we are obviously going to have morning church on the 24th. No offense to the person that asked me that question, um, but uh, yes, we are going to have morning service. If it was December 25th, we would have morning service. Uh, we do not cancel a Sunday morning service for anything, okay? So just wanted to, wanted to put that out there. Um, we are doing church on the 24th, okay? A uh, couple query qu requests that I wanted to ask. Um, normally, we don't pray for health needs on Sunday nights. We pray for spiritual needs. But I, I just was uh, talking to Mike Davis this morning, and um, I don't know if you know this, a couple weeks ago, Asa, about a week, actually not even a couple weeks ago, a little more than a week ago, uh, Asa had a major seizure, major seizure, his little boy, and um, uh and uh, it happened while he was at work, and his wife, and they went to the hospital, and they took him up to Champaign, and he was up there for overnight, and they did, a, I think, an EEG, and they found um, he actually had a seizure during the EEG. So he, he has some kind of a seizure disorder, and they're going to probably start medicating him for that, and uh, I, I know a little bit about this. It, that is a hard thing to go through watching your kids go through like medical uncertainty like that. And so just pray for the, the Davis family. Maybe send them a note of encour encouragement. Uh, offer to help them in any way you can. I know that would go a long way. Um, but pray for the Davises. Pray for little Asa that the doctors will be able to figure this out and the, the Lord will be able to heal them. And then this morning, I don't know if she still is, but Jenna was in the hospital. I believe that's probably where Brother Adam is this evening. So if you'll pray for, pray for both of those things. Um, who would like to pray for those prayer requests for me? Anybody? Brother Mark. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here tonight, Lord, we're going to share some prayer requests, Lord. Lord, I'm a father, and all the fathers here somewhat feel as I feel, as when our children hurt, we hurt, Lord. Be with Brother Mike and Sister Mallory, Lord. Be with this their child, Asha, Lord, and this episode of their life. Give them wisdom. If it's a medical team we need to put together, that they need to put together, Lord, we pray that they seek wisdom and show them how they need to go about this, Lord. Be with all their other children also, Lord. Watch over this young lad, Lord. I pray you put a hedge around this young boy and just protect him. Help Mike and Mallory, Lord. Lord, Sister Jenna and Brother Adam, Lord, we pray for her, her physical, and her, her her emotionals. They're going through a lot right now with the new baby and everything, Lord. Help us to comfort them as best as we can, Lord. And you come down and comfort them to help them lean upon you in these times when sometimes nothing else will do but your comfort, Lord. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, Two other things I wanted to mention as far as ministry-related prayer requests. One of them, we have our cantata coming up. What's the date of the cantata? It's the 16th and 17th, correct? So that is a uh, drama and music, and we've been working on it for, for feels like forever, uh, having extra choir practices. Brother Ken always does a really good job, and I believe Miss Annis, are you doing the helping oversee the, the play part? Um, so that is coming up. Uh, 
pray that we can get some visitors to come in for that, that the gospel goes out clearly for that. Um, appreciate that. Brother Steve Roberts, would you pray for that, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity we have again today to come to before you, Lord, as we share our burdens and our praises, Lord, as, as we ask uh, to be with this cantata as an outreach of our church to the community, Lord, we pray that uh, it will help uh, open the eyes in the gospel and, and uh, that we'll be able to uh, speak clearly and plainly the message that it comes along with this musical, Lord, we just pray that for everyone that we pray for our health also the sickness doesn't come right before that and, and Lord during the play when the message is being told Lord that it will be able to touch the hearts of those around and Lord we pray that the message will get out Lord we have lots of uh, visitors Lord and, and during that time that people will uh, see you as Lord and Savior we thank you so much for the opportunities that you've given us and we just pray amen um, one other request, um, Brother Dick, I'll ask you to pray for this one. Um, we've had a couple visitors. Uh, we had a couple visitors this morning. Um, there's one uh, family that's come several times uh, that we know personally. Um, I, the, their son is on the swim team, and the dad is one of the coaches. And I just found out uh, through just conversation this week that she used to go when she was a little girl. The mom, when she was a little girl, was in Miss uh, – Jody's Sunday school class, uh, Jody um, Drummond, and so that's that's kind of neat. Um, but they don't they don't really have much of a church background, and they're starting to ask more and more uh, questions, spiritual questions. They've got their boy in Christian school, and so he's coming home and asking questions, and he wants to come to Awana and all those things. So just pray the Lord works on that. And then it was good to see uh, Dalton and his wife here this morning. Um, Dalton was literally the only teenager in the church when I first came here, and uh, pray that he uh, pray that he starts coming um, some more, or, or at least finds a good church home. So would you pray for those things, brother uh, brother Dick? Father, I just thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for being able to spend some time with Dalton and his wife, Lord. Be with them and, and help them to understand what they need. Help them to, to learn. Help them to come back and help, help us to be a, a witness to them and, and lead them back to you, Lord. Father, I pray for this other family that you will, that you've sent our way. and Help us to, to uh, help them to answer their questions for them, Lord, and just be with us and keep us all safe for pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want, to say, I want to say thank you to everybody that came yesterday to the work day. Um, we, we had uh, quite a few people here. Um, no complaints about the amount of people that showed up. We had, we had just a lot of little tiny things to do, uh, a lot of painting, uh, we completely repainted the fellowship hall, the inside of the fellowship hall. We painted doors that haven't been painted in 10 years. Uh, just a lot of walls that needed paint, things that needed touched up. And if you came and were a part of that, thank you. Uh, Brother Matt got up on the big bucket truck and helped fix the, uh, the siding on the, on the uh, building there. And that was a blessing that's been off for far too long. Um, and so that was a blessing. And uh, just if you came, I know Saturdays are precious. Like, I guard Saturdays like nothing else. Um, and so I try to be really careful about not over-scheduling things like work days because I know some of you feel like you have to come to all of them. And um, thank you all for coming and working and, and getting everything done yesterday. That was a blessing. All right, uh, let's have one more song. Um, Brother Hedrick, if you'll come, and then we'll get into the Word tonight. 556, hymn 556, come ye thankful people, come, we'll sing the first, the second, and the last, let's stand please to sing.
Thing. Do not forget that the service this week, the midweek service, is not on Wednesday. It is on Tuesday so that uh, people can, can travel if they're traveling um, and people can cook if they're cooking. I don't know uh, what the need is there, but Tuesday is when we're going to have our service. So there will not be a WANA uh, this week. Uh, everything is going to be on Tuesday. No WANA, no uh, collating. All right. Second Peter, chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one. Um, earlier this year, I traveled uh, to New Hampshire to go to my nana's funeral, and while I was there, I stayed at my brother Tim's house. And my brother Tim is really into uh, filmmaking. He's really into movies. And, uh, and making videos. And every time I'm with him, he wants to show me some movie that I have never seen or have any interest in seeing before. And that night, he cornered me, he had me in his house, and he introduced me to the genre of mountaineering documentaries. All right, now that sounds really boring, doesn't it? Um, what could be more boring than a documentary? I'll tell you, a documentary of a bunch of people climbing a hill. That's pretty boring. But, uh, <laughs> but we watched this movie, and honestly, uh, this movie that Tim uh, had, a, had me watch that night was actually really awesome. It, it stuck in my head. So it's about these three guys, and they're trying to climb this 21,000 uh, 21, mountain, 21, foot mountain peak in uh, the Indian Himalayas. Um, it's one of the last unclimbed rock faces in the world. Uh, it never been climbed before. And they get up there, and I say up there, I mean they're literally, that, that is like 21,000 feet up in the air. That, that's huge. It's like four miles up in the air. It's unbelievably high. Like you, whatever, however high you're thinking, it's higher than that. They're up there, and they're on, there's nowhere for the go. It's a straight up rock face. It takes several days of climbing straight up this rock face. There's nowhere for them to go. So they have this little tiny tent that they're staying in called a porta ledge. Three guys in a little tent hanging from ropes off of the edge of that rock face. 20,000 feet in the air. Can you imagine? And they get up there. And the weather turns nasty. This terrible winter storm comes through, howling winds, uh, like negative temperatures. They're in there for days, just stuck in that little tent, hanging off the edge of this mountain. Sound like fun to anybody. They eat up all their food. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 they, they, they have nowhere to get food. They're on top of a mountain. Like, what are they going to do? And then... The ledge breaks, and their portal ledge breaks, and it took them 16 days to get up there. It's awful stuff, isn't it? So they failed. Well, three years later, they tried to do it again. And a couple months before they went out, one of them is out skiing, and he gets in this horrific skiing accident, so bad that the doctors wondered if he would ever walk again. And this guy's like, not only am I going to walk, I'm going to climb this mountain in three months. And so he does, uh, makes this miraculous recovery. He decides to climb it anyways. They're on the way up that giant rock face, and the guy that had this miraculous recovery has a stroke. They have two days of climbing left. Do you know what happened? They kept climbing. And miraculously, they climbed it in eight days, only eight days. They're the only three people that have ever climbed this mountain. They videotaped most of the thing. And um, they did it with a guy who just had a stroke and wasn't even supposed to be walking. Now, that is an amazing story. Why do we admire stories like that? 
I, I used to read books like about like Ernest Shackleton's expeditions to the Antarctic. Why do you like stories like that? Well, they're stories, um, they're stories about endurance. Think about what these guys did. It's, in a sense, think about it, in a sense, that's stupid. Like, there's no scientific value in them climbing up that rock face. If they needed to go and see what was on top of there, a helicopter would have done just fine, right? Uh, they risked their lives. They all have families. They risked never seeing their children again. There was a high probability they would never come down from that voyage. That's dumb. So why do they inspire us? They inspire us because they're stories of endurance. Endurance. Endurance is something we don't talk about enough. And it is one of the virtues that we're going to look at here tonight. So 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll read the first eight verses. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that uh, have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been looking at this list here. Whenever we get to these lists, I like to slow way down and look at each one thing individually. Okay, And so we've been working our way through these virtues that Peter tells us to add. And he started with virtue, the word virtue. And the word virtue is best understood as moral character. You cannot make it through the Christian life unscathed if you don't work on moral character and add moral character. Right? Um, you have to be a person of character. And then it says, add your faith knowledge. Like, God wants us to know some things. God wants us to develop our knowledge. God doesn't want us to be ignorant Christians. And then last week, I talked about how we need to add temperance. Temperance means self-control. Control over our appetites. Control over our emotions. Control over our self. Self-control. And now we're on to this fourth thing. And it says in verse 6 that we're to add to our, our faith, you know, going back to the first verse, adding to our faith, patience. Now, patience is one of those words that has come to mean something since 1611 that's different than it, it meant in 1611 when the King James was translated, okay? Patience means something different today. Today, when we talk about patience, we're usually talking about passively waiting, right? So I, it's almost always used passively. Like, I had to have patience at the doctor's office today. I had to pa have patience at CVS because they made me wait for an hour to get my prescription. Or please have patience with me as I try to figure this out. That's how we use that word, right? That's not how it was used in the Bible. In the Bible, patience meant something very similar to that, but with an important distinction. The word patience is from the Greek word, I don't need to read it to you, but hup, hupomone, um, which literally means to remain under, to remain under. Okay, And when the Greeks talked about patience, it was never a passive thing. It was always an active thing. It was never just waiting out the storm. Okay, It was always an active thing. Uh, Jim Berg says this about patience. He said, in its classical usage, patience connotes courageous endurance that fully defies evil and thus is active rather than passive. So when Peter tells us we have to add to our faith patience, he's telling us that we need to cultivate an active endurance. We need to have a little bit of the stuff um, spiritually, 
that those guys had physically that climbed that mountain. Okay? Endurance. Now, i got a very simple message for you this evening. It's, it's, it's not going to be super deep. Okay? In fact, you can sum it all up with three words. You need patience. You need endurance. Right? That's really it. Okay? But I'm going to give you three reasons why you need endurance, why you need patience. Okay? So number one, Christians need patience. This is real deep, okay? Because the Bible tells us we do. Christians need patience because the Bible tells us we do. That's a pretty simple point. But it's an important point. I don't want you to miss this. About 25 times in the New Testament, the Bible either tells us that we need to have patience or holds up some person or some church and says, I commend your patience. Okay? So patience is not a minor virtue. This is something that the Bible talks about a lot. Um, I'm going to do something I don't like to do. My, I heard one comment, uh, one criticism of a preacher once, and uh, they said he was a concordance preacher, meaning that all he did was just read verses. So I, I, that's always stuck in my head, and I don't like to read a million verses. Tonight we're going to read a million verses. We'll put them up on the screen um, you don't have to turn if you, if you don't want to, uh, but we're going to look through a bunch of these verses as we read about this concept of patience. And I just want you to see how important this is. Luke 21, 16 to 19 says this, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren, and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your heads perish, in your patience, possess ye your souls. This is our Lord speaking. And he's talking about some of the struggles that Christians are going to go through. And he says, you need to possess your souls in patience with this active endurance. Let's look at some verses in Romans. Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Romans 5, 3 and 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Romans 15, 4 and 5. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. I'm halfway done. 2 Corinthians 6, 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. James 1, 3, and 4. Knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James 5, 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure, we have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now that's just a smattering of verses. I, I did not read them all. might seem like I did, but I did not read all the verses in the New Testament. I just want you to understand that this is not a minor thing, biblically speaking. In the New Testament, this is something that is talked about a lot. Our Lord commanded patience. Paul in many books, commanded patience. James talked about patience. Peter talked about patience. Uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about patience. I didn't read anything from the Apostle John, but the Apostle John talks about patience in um, the book of Revelation. So every writer of the New Testament, I guess not Mark, sorry, and Matthew, almost every writer of the New Testament talks about patience, commends patience. This is an important truth. We need patience. The Bible says over and over again, we have to have patience. We have to have endurance. Why do you need endurance? Because you're going to endure things. That's profound, isn't it? 
Why do you need endurance? Because you're going to endure things. You are going to go through some hard things. And that leads to the number two reason. Christians need patience. Christians will need patience because the path of following Christ is never easy. It's never easy. You know, we have the health and wealth people that are on TV. You know, God wants to bless you. God wants to fill your bank account. God wants to, you know, make you fabulously wealthy. And uh, the doctors will stay away from your house. And you'll never have any problems as long as you send the right amount of faith gift to me, right? That's, that's about how it goes. Um, you know what? The problem with that is the problem with that is it's completely foreign to what the Bible teaches. The people the Bible holds up as examples for us, one of the things that they all have in common is they all endured hardships. None of them had it easy. They had real hardships to go through. Let me let me read you some um, some verses here from Hebrews chapter. End of Hebrews chapter 11. And I want you to think about this. Think about uh, what these Christians held up as, uh, as people of faith. Listen what, what they went through. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, a bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Stop. They were cut in half with saws. That's gross. Anyways, keep going. All right. Were tempted were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect." Think about all those things those people went through. Does any of that sound fun? You know, when you're planning out your, your calendar for next year, how do you're like, all right, you know, maybe October next year, I'll get cut in half with a saw. And then maybe, you know, I can wander in sheepskins and goatskins through the wilderness. That sounds like a good thing to do in December. Nobody does that. Here's the point. The point is that every one of these people that's held up as a hero of faith endured hardship. They endured hardship. Think about Paul. Listen to this from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 28. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as the fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Does that sound like the health and wealth gospel to you? No. Paul endured some stuff, didn't he? He had to go through some things. One more example. Think about our Lord. Did, did Jesus have an easy go of it on this earth? He was mistreated. He couldn't find rest. He was betrayed by those closest to him. He was rejected by the very ones he was giving his life for. 
And listen, if you're following Christ, you can mark this down. There will be hardship. There will be difficulty. You need patience. You need endurance because you're going to endure things. You know, just thinking about our congregation right now. We have people, like we've talked about, people in our churches in the hospital. We have people in our church whose kids are going through uh, serious illnesses. We have people in our church that are dealing with profound loss. We have people in our church that have uncertain financial situations. We have all these different things. There's all these different problems that people in our church are going through, and those are just the ones that we know about. There's chances are there's lots of problems in the church that I don't know about, that you don't know about. People that are bearing terrible weights and terrible burdens that they, they don't talk to anybody about. Life always has problems. Unsaved people have problems. Saved people have problems, right? Everybody has to deal with problems. There's no getting out of that. If you live in this life, it doesn't matter if you're the king of England, you're going to deal with problems. You're going to deal with your fair share of pain. But for for Christians, God uses those problems to forge us. God uses those problems to forge our faith. You ever ever been to a forge? Ever seen a blacksmith at work? They take a metal bar and they stick it in the fire, right? And they heat it up until it's glowing hot. Not so much fun for the, for the metal object, right? They pull the metal object out and then they take a big hammer and they stick that thing on an anvil and they pound and they pound and they pound and they pound it until they're trying to get it into the shape they want it to be. They pick it up, they're like, not yet. Stick it back in the fire. Rinse and repeat over and over and over again, shaping it to something that is useful. And here's the thing. If we would be used by God, we got to go through the forge. If we would be used by God, we have to endure some things. That is God's plan. That has always been God's plan. Think about Joseph. God had a wonderful thing in store for Joseph. Joseph was going to deliver his people. Joseph was going to become probably the most powerful person in practice in the world, right? He had this wonderful thing, but he wasn't ready for that as a 12-year-old boy. He had to go through the forge first. Think about David. David, going to be the king of Israel, going to be the person that sets up the temple, all the wonderful things that God had in store for David. David wasn't ready for that yet when he was a, a small boy. He had to go through the forge first. He had to go through Ziklag first. He had to deal with Saul first. And we could go on and on. Examples in Scripture. Christians need patience. Because the, the path of following Christ is never easy. Last point. One more reason why Christians need patience. Christians will need patience because there will be opposition. There will be opposition. Let me remind you, we live in a spiritual warfare. We are all, as believers, whether we want to be or not, we are in the middle of a spiritual war. We have real spiritual enemies, and that means that there will be opposition. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. Let me read you these very familiar verses. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Okay? We are spiritual soldiers in a spiritual battle. One of the things that people learn when they go to boot camp is they learn to obey orders, right? They learn all about the military. They learn all of, all of those things. But a big part of it is them learning some endurance. 
physical endurance because if they get stuck in a foxhole somewhere or they get stuck in a trench somewhere or they get stuck doing uh, soldiering duty somewhere overseas, chances are they're going to endure some physical hardship. And they need endurance. Fighting is hard. Um, listen to what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.3 to Timothy. He said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When you're in a fight, it requires incredible endurance. I've told this story before. It's not a super flattering story. I'm going to tell it again. Um, when I was in college, okay, first off, I was 65 pounds lighter in college. So imagine me at my current height, minus 65 pounds. I was in college. I got, voluntarily, I got in one wrestling match when I was in college. There's always people wanting to wrestle me. I wonder why. But one person I picked, and I was like, I'm going to wrestle this kid. His name was Paul. He was the only kid in school skinnier than me. And I think he was missing half a lung. OK? And uh, we were roommates. We were friends. We didn't hate each other. We just decided one day we were going to have a wrestling match. And Paul, he decided he was not going to lose. And I sure, is not, I, I sure wasn't going to lose to Paul, OK? And so we wrestled, and our little wrestling match lasted for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Those 30 minutes felt like hours. Those were like the longest 30 minutes of my life. And I don't think anyone won. I think we just both collapsed at the end. Like, we just like, all right, it's a draw, right? And we just collapsed at the end. And it took forever for me to get up. Him too, okay? Just want to clarify. Him too. <laughs> took forever for me to get up. And when I got up, I had rug burns all over my body. Um, I, I felt like I'd been run over by a train, not a 100-pound weakling named Paul. And I was so tired. I was so tired. Okay? Battling is exhausting. It's hard work. And sometimes the spiritual battles that we face are exhausting. Sometimes they just beat us up. Sometimes they leave us feeling like spiritually rug burned and we can't imagine going another step. Sometimes we feel like those guys in that tent, you know, hanging dangerously by a thin cord over a fall that would absolutely kill us, just trying not to freeze to death waiting for the storm to pass. But you know what? We have this confidence as believers. God is in control. And God is always good. I want to look at two more passages of Scripture and we'll be done. Real quick. 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We've already read this verse. We'll read it again. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We are in a race, and it is a marathon. Okay, You don't bring backpacks into a marathon. It's an endurance race, a long-distance race. We need endurance. We need patience. Look at the next two verses. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Whenever you're going through a tough time of hardship or opposition, whenever you feel, you know, let down, what does the Bible tell us to do? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Okay? Nothing that you or I could possibly go through is foreign to him. Look to him. There is amazing power to be found in looking to Jesus and considering Jesus, considering what he went through on our behalf. He is our example in many things, and one of the things he's an example of for us is he's an example of endurance. An example of endurance. One more passage, Romans chapter 8. I've been talking about endurance. Endurance is not a fun thing to talk about. You know that? 
Nobody, nobody wants to hear, hey, uh, buck up, you're going to have a really hard time. Not a fun thing to say. All right, I want to end on an encouraging note here. Romans chapter 8. Um, look at verses 31 to 39. These are some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written? For thy sakes we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? Here's the one thing to remember as we endure hardships. God is in control. God is in control. God is good. He knows what he's doing. Earlier in this chapter is that famous, all things work together for good, right? God knows what's going on. He is in control. He accepts you through Christ. And God is for you if you're following him. And he says nothing, nothing can separate you from his love. All right? Nothing can separate you from his love. No amount of hardship that life can throw at you can keep you out of the love of God can remove God's good purposes for you. So what do you do? Okay? Keep going. Keep enduring. All right? Add to your faith patience. Add to your faith endurance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for uh, the fact that we know that you're watching out for you. I know, Lord, that there's people in our church that are going through hardships. They're going through hard times. Um, maybe even things that we don't know about, things that we don't see. Father, I pray that you'll work in their life and help them. Help them, Lord, to, to develop endurance. Lord, um, it's such a, a tough thing to ask for because we know to ask for it is to invite these hardships into our life. There's no endurance without hardships. But Lord, it's your plan for us that we endure those things, that we go through some difficulty. Help us to see your hand in it, to see your goodness, even in the bad things that we have to deal with, and to trust ever more in you. Help us to look to Jesus. Always look to Jesus as our example of endurance, as our example of patience, and to keep running for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask Brother Hedrick if you want to come and close us in a song, please. I'd appreciate it. Hymn 680, six, hymn, hymn 680, we'll sing the first la and last of Rejoice in the